Chapter 15, Over the River and Through the Rocks. A half hour of clawing at rocks, a half hour of breaking our nails and bloodying our fingers convinced us there was no possible way of returning the way we had come. This is your fault, said Fauna to Herky. We should have left you here to rot. Girl mean, said Herky, but he said it without much spirit. Since we couldn't go back, we decided to go forward, though I had some concern about whether we might be walking into a goblin trap. Holding the amulet aloft, I led the way past Herky's rock on through the tunnel, which was narrow but very high. After a while, the wall on our right disappeared, leaving a high wall to our left and flat, open space to the right. I wondered if the way out lay somewhere in that direction, but if we went that way, we could quickly become lost in the emptiness. By sticking with the wall, we could always retrace our steps, though what good that would do us, I didn't know. Sometimes I thought I heard footsteps behind us, but when I stopped to listen more carefully, the footsteps, if that's what they were, stopped too. None of us spoke much, not even Herky. The rock wall to our left was smooth. Sometimes water trickled down its surface. When we got thirsty enough, we would lap some of the water from the wall. It was cold and sweet. The decision to stay with the wall proved wise because after a while, the floor to the right disappeared as well. Now we were walking along a ledge about a foot and a half wide. With the rocky wall to the left and a sheer drop to the right, I held the amulet out over the dark drop. Its light did not reach the bottom. When we came to a notch in the wall big enough for the three of us to sit safely back from the edge of the abyss, we stopped for a rest. I passed around some food. Icky, said Erky, Herky, but he ate some of the bread. There was nothing else for him. I was worried that we might run out soon, but when I closed the packets, they seemed as full as they had the very first time I opened them. I smiled. Though the map had lost its usefulness after we foolishly left the path, at least this bit of Granny Pinchbottom's magic was still working. We decided to sleep. I gave my brain a strict command that I was not to roll over. It wasn't that far to a drop that seemed to have no end. I don't know how long I had been sleeping when Herky's voice woke me. When I opened my eyes to scold him, I saw that he was asleep himself. He was jerking and twitching and muttering, cold and dark, dark and cold, nothing, nothing, nothing. After a moment, I realized he must be dreaming about the North Tower. Remembering the horror of the place, I laid my hand on my forehead. <coughs> it seemed to settle him, and soon he was sleeping peacefully. Oh, on his forehead. He was sleeping peacefully again. I did not go back to sleep myself. I still had my eyes open when Fauna whispered, William, what? I'm afraid. Me too. What are we going to do? Keep going. That's what I thought. <laughs> A while later, we did just that. Before long, the wall to the left disappeared as well. Now we had about a foot and a half of path, and that was it. On our right and our left was a sheer drop to a depth we could not guess. By the light of the amulet, I could see that the path, path curving through the void ahead of us, winding left, right, rising, dipping, disappearing into the darkness. Far beneath us, I could hear the sound of a rushing river. The path grew narrower, a foot wide, then less. Every step became a matter of life and death. I felt like I was walking along the edge of a giant razor. And still, I thought I could hear footsteps behind us. We began to grow tired again, but there was no place to rest. More than once, I stumbled in my exhaustion. The path stopped at a sheer wall. For a terrifying moment, I thought we were blocked. That after all this, we would have to turn around and go back. But when I lifted the amulet a little higher, I could see an opening about eight feet to our right. There was even a way to get over it. If you consider a ridge of stone as wide as your hand, a way to go somewhere. We didn't have much choice. Slipping the silver chain around my head, I flipped it around so that the amulet hung against my back. Then I pressed myself against the wall and began inching toward the opening. Herky came close behind me. His long, nimble fingers and toes seemed to make this fairly simple for him. Fauna came last, her face set and grim. I felt better when I put my hand around the edge of the opening, and better still when I pulled myself inside and saw that it went on for a way. Taking the amulet off my neck, I thrust it back out so Fauna could have light to finish the trip. Once she was inside, we began walking again. It wasn't long before the tunnel began to grow narrower. 
More enclosed. Looking up, I could see the rock ceiling above us, something I had barely seen in all the time we had been trapped in the caverns. Soon the ceiling grew lower. The walls grew closer together. I don't like this, said Fauna. I didn't like it either. Herky, I said, run ahead. Come back and tell us how small the tunnel gets. You bet, William. Scurrying between my legs, he disappeared into the darkness. A few moments later, he came dashing back, scrambled up my legs, and put his hands around my middle. Then he jumped down and ran off again. When he returned the next time, he climbed all the way to my shoulders and put his hands next to my head. What are you doing? I asked. Measuring, he replied as he jumped down and disappeared into the darkness. After a bit, his voice came back down the tunnel. I think you fit, William. I didn't particularly like the sound of that. I turned to Fauna. She shrugged. I knew what that meant. I knew what she meant. What else was there to do? I started forward. Before long, I had to drop to my hands and knees. The stone was smooth and cold beneath my fingers. Soon the ceiling was so low that I began to scrape my head. I stuffed Igor's bear into the bag Granny Pinchbottom had given me, then tied the bag to my foot, dropping to my belly. I began to crawl. The sides of the tunnel grew so close together that they began to scrape against me. I felt as if I were being squeezed by a giant hand. Hoping Herky was right when he said I, that I would fit, I stretched my hands ahead of me and pulled myself forward. Hiya, said Herky, sticking his face into mine. Then he thrust out his long fingers and messed up my hair. Herky, I yelled, don't do that. William mad, he asked, sounding hurt. Just nervous. How much farther do I have to go? Herky, go check, he said, turning and moving easily through the tiny space that was giving me such trouble. He didn't come back. Hey. Herky, I called. No answer. Herky! No answer. He's probably playing some kind of game, said Fauna from behind me. I pulled myself forward, hoping she was right. The tunnel grew even tighter. I couldn't move to the right or the left, and I couldn't raise my head more than an inch or two without running into the rock. Against my will, I began to picture the vastness of what lay ahead above me, the mountain of rock held up by what? My out-of-control imagination saw it slipping, crushing me, been deep in the earth where no one would ever find me. Stop! I commanded myself out loud. Why? asked Fauna. Sorry, I was talking to myself, staring ahead. I shouted, Herky! No answer. I pulled myself forward, wondering how accurate his measurements had been, and whether I might soon find myself hopelessly jammed into this ever-diminishing tunnel, tighter and tighter still, until I felt as though I were breathing stone. I began to think little things were crawling over me. The fact that nothing seemed to live down here didn't stop my frenzied imagination from inventing rock worms, nasty creatures that burrowed through stone and human flesh. I began to imagine them working their way into my skin. Forward, slowly forward, ever more cramped. Would the tunnel become so tight it would scrape away the cloak and collar I had tucked inside my shirt? I slid back a few inches and picked up the silver chain on my in my teeth to keep the amulet from being squished, squashed between my chest and the stone floor. Are you all right? Whispered Fauna from behind me. Yes, I replied, though that was only half answer. Does it get any better? She asked nervously. I spit out the amulet chain, not as far as I can tell. She didn't reply. Lifting the amulet with my teeth again, I crawled forward. Soon the tunnel was so tight that I couldn't bring my arms back to my sides. They were extended full length in front of me, and that was where they had to stay. My nose began to itch. Inching forward, inching forward, I came to a place where the space between the roof and the floor of the tunnel was so narrow, I wasn't sure my head would fit through. When Herky had checked the size of my head, he had used nothing but his hands. How accurate could his measurement have been? If I went forward, would I jam my head into a place from which I could never release it? Herky! No answer. Where had he gone? And then behind us, the sound of goblins laughing. Fauna grabbed my foot. Did you hear? She hissed. I heard, I replied, turning my head sideways. I squirmed forward. Cold rock pressed against my temples, pulling with my fingertips, pressing with my feet. I moved another inch, then stopped. I could go no further. Let the goblins laugh. They couldn't get at, get at me anywhere. William said, Fauna, keep going. I can't. But that wasn't true. When I moved my head to the left, I found a spare half inch. Emptying my lungs to make myself flatter, I pushed myself forward. Something cold and scaly grabbed my hands and began to pull.